Welcome guys. back to Cemeteries Down Under. We're here on a lovely rainy day in Sydney. We're actually at Rookwood Cemetery. Now it's the biggest one in the Southern Hemisphere, but not the oldest. It started out in about 1860. Um, we used to have a train station and it used to be called Haslam's Creek Cemetery. Now this place is so big, it's got its own postcode and it's known as the Necropolis of the Dead, um, which is the city of the dead. Now we're going to introduce you to a few characters, but this is going to be like a four part series because this place is so huge. And at the end of this um, video today, we're going to show you a drone footage of how big it actually is. It's like 200 hectares, all different sections. And we're in the Catholic section, the old Catholic section. And this is St. Michael the Archangel Church, which I love. It's one of my favorite part of the cemeteries. Um, here you've got a lot of settled Irish convicts, um, freed convicts, and a lot of the old Catholic set settlers that lived here, as well as the priests and the nuns, there's special sections for them. Now the first burial here was in like 1860 and it was a pauper called John Whalen. So he doesn't have a marker on his grave. But um, follow us and we'll show you a little bit of the cemetery today. Here are the Catholic priests of St. Michael the Archangel Church. So this is the section where all the priests are buried.
This large war cemetery was established by the military authorities in 1942. It contains mainly the graves of those who died in the Concord Military Hospital, either of wounds received in operational areas or through sickness or accident. The war cemetery was taken over by the Commission in December 1946. Sydney War Cemetery contains 732 Commonwealth burials and commemorations of the Second World War. Those members of the United Kingdom forces who were buried in the cemetery died while prisoners of war in Japanese hands and were cremated. These are all the crem cremation plaques right here. So they, a lot of them were um, prisoners of war and died in Japanese hands. After the war, an Army Grave Service arranged for their ashes to be brought by HMMAS MAS Newfoundland to Sydney for interment. Among the war graves is that of one civilian who died while in the employment of the Admiralty during the war. There is also one French war grave. Okay. Over 3,000 of the Commonwealth's First World War dead are buried in Australia, most of them Australians. Many lie singly or in small groups in public cemeteries throughout seven states. But over the years it has proved impossible to maintain some of these sites to an acceptable standard. To ensure the proper commemoration of those who died as a result of service in the First World War, and indeed subsequent campaigns, gardens, gardens of remembrance have been laid out in each state. So it contains 393 First World War burials and 253 from the Second World War. So this section here, uh, where soldiers were transported from Gallipoli, um, they found their remains in unmarked graves several years ago and they were transported with honours to Australia and they're here now in rest at Rookwood um, forever where people can pay their respects for their service to Australia. This area is the Garden of Remembrance, it's quite beautiful with its fountains and this is where a lot of the First World War veterans are cremated and also the English prisoners of war from Japan 
there, mainly on the wall over there, on the far end side. And you've got a couple hundred of the Second World War as well here. And this is the biggest war cemetery in Australia, here in Rookwood. So here lies William Henry Davenport. Now he died in 1841. Now he was, with his brother, a illusionist and a magician. And they had shows all over the world and they were quite famous. Then he contracted TB. And when he was on tour here in Australia, <laughs> he unfortunately passed away. And this is his grave. He's buried here in Rookwood. And he was so famous and so well respected by the magicians of the world that even Houdini came to visit him and pay his respects. Hi, we're at the grave of Bingley. Now anyone that watches TV in Australia and buys white goods or anything like that would know the store being lit. And remember, for lowest prices and biggest bargains, this side of Hong Kong! Yeah. 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 Um, and this is the man that started it all and he has quite an unusual and tragic tale. So he was a retailer born in 1908 and he was born in um, Shandong which is a province of China and after studying commerce Bing worked as a wireless operator in the merchant navy and he married Sho Fen on the 12th of July in 1931 at Chelu and an early photograph of Lee shows a studious respected young man with open almost dreamy face and his maritime career came to an abrupt stop in 1938 after the Japanese occupation of China. Now refusing to work for his new masters, Lee took a job with some school friends who had begun a business exporting Chinese handicrafts to Australia. He left his wife, son and daughter behind and arrived in Sydney in 1939 for an intended three year sales venture. Stranded in Australia as a result of World War II, Lee took various jobs in support of the Allied war effort. Back in China, his family struggled to survive the deprivations of war without him. After Japan's surrender in 1945, Shofen joined exodus of the refugees, fleeing to Shanghai and then Hong Kong. In 1949, she and the children gained births aboard a ship to Australia. Their family settled in Fairfield, Sydney, alongside thousands of other post-war immigrants. He opened a fruit and veggie shop. Following the advent of television in the 1950s, he bought a small electrical repair shop and began selling televisions to his fellow migrants. These customers, denied credit by other stores because they lacked financial standing, would create a loyal consumer base for generations to come and Bing Lee's shrewd trading skills evidence in his ability to assess who could make good their loans or business flourish. And to this day, Bing Lee is a worldwide name for white goods and other furniture in Australia. So he started off as just a middle class man, hard working man, and he's built his foundations today, which his children still run. So, um, that's his story. It's an amazing, amazing story. And we'd like to thank him for all the hard work he's done for all of us. And, and never gave up on his dream. Thank you, sir. So we're currently in the Italian vault section and they're created to look like little houses like they were back in the village that they grew up in. And 
the reason why when you go to a lot of vaults in the cemetery and you see a photo um, they put the photo there because their belief is that a photograph of the deceased close to the shrine symbolically ensures closeness to the saints in the next life. So I found that a little bit interesting. This headstone, you wouldn't believe it. My name's Julia King and guess what? This lady carries my namesake. They're not relatives of mine. Um, it's just quite a coincidence that a woman with my name is buried at the same cemetery. the vaults of James and John Tuies. They were two brothers. Now they ran two pubs in Melbourne and they were from the Gold Rush era and they were back in the 18, early 1800s and in 1860 they came up with the idea to start up a beer and that beer was Tuies beer and it became a worldwide success. Everybody knows about Tuies and um, here are their vaults resting with their family. So two Irish brothers who had been running pubs in Melbourne travelled to Sydney to make their own beer and create an Australian icon. It is the 1860s and Australia's population had exploded thanks to the previous decade's gold rush. The cities of Melbourne and Sydney are growing quite quickly. Business confidence is rising rapidly. Newspapers such as the Argus in Melbourne and the Sydney Morning Herald had been established. John Thomas and James Matthew Tui, born to Irish immigrants Matthew and Honora, can smell opportunity over the distinct aroma of hops and yeast in their pubs, the Limerick Arms and the Great Britain in Melbourne. John Thomas tries various different business ventures in Victoria, New Zealand and Queensland and even a sugar mill near Lismore, while James has a property near Coonamble. It is in 1870 that John's greatest business venture begins. He obtains his brewing license and after opening an auctioneer company and cordial factory, he starts brewing beer with his brother James. Hey, I hope you enjoyed our journey of Rookwood Cemetery. Now like I said, there will be more parts to this because there's so many more names that I want to introduce you to um, that are buried here. So many more stories oh, to tell. You. But we hope you liked the first part and um, stay tuned to part two. See you soon. See you soon, guys.